Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be doers of it. We thank you for all that you're going to accomplish through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're continuing to share a lot of important messages for you to become the glorious church, to come to the place of perfection, and to become like Jesus Christ. Today we're going to talk about the subject of clothing yourself with the garments of God. It is absolutely of a necessity that you do this in your life if you're going to see God accomplish what He purposes. We begin with Psalms 93, verse 1. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith He hath girded Himself. The world also established that it cannot be moved. Notice, the Lord clothed Himself with majesty and with strength. And notice, how did that happen? He girded Himself. That means the Lord clothed himself. How does he clothe himself? Through the word of God, which is what produces all of these things. God wants us to understand that you and I are to clothe ourselves in the same manner with the garments of God they are going to produce his strength, his righteousness, his holiness, his power, all the things that he wants to bring forth in our life. We see over in Psalms 104, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. He's clothed with strength. He's clothed with majesty. He's clothed with honor. The Lord clothed Himself with all of these things. When we look at Jesus, we see over in Mark, in chapter 9, when Jesus was transfigured, we see in Mark chapter 9, verse 2, after six days, Jesus taketh with them Peter and James and John, lead them up to a mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment, that would be his garments, became shining, exceeding white as snow, as no fooler. This is the word fooler we're talking about in the Old Testament, where a fooler was one who would whiten a garment as white as possible, as no fooler on earth can whiten them can white them. That shows the fact that his raiment was white. And it goes on and it says, they appeared to Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus here. And then they, of course, they were wanting to make the tabernacles with them for each one. But one thing we need to realize, his raiment, his clothing, was shining. It was white as snow. It, like a fooler had whitened this. Well, we see another scripture over in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 29. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening, glistering, or like light, like lightning. This is what Jesus, this is what his countenance was like. And what were they essentially seeing? It was revealed for them, to them, to see in the Spirit what his clothes were, what he had upon him. They saw what he was like, having seen it in the Spirit. Well, how did Jesus get these clothes? How did he get to this place of having these glistening white garments? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, it reveals it. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of the Man, this is Jesus, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps with a golden girdle. When it talks about clothed with here, this particular word, clothed with, is a Greek word, and duo. Or if you're here for the first time in the lower window, we bring up information. This is Strong's, the numbers that cor uh, correspond to Strong's concordance. Greek word, meanings, different things of tense, voice, and mood that are important. This word means to like sink into clothing or put clothing on. And this particular word here, we see it has a tense, voice, and mood that are important. The tense is the perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek describes action completed in the past with present effects at the time of speaking. Meaning, this is talking about what Jesus did. Because he had clothed himself in the past with the present effects at the time of speaking with this garment. And he had done this himself 
for his benefit because it's a middle voice. The middle voice, whenever you see that in the Greek, it is describing action done by the subject who is talking about Jesus, the Son of Man, and that he did it for himself when it's middle voice. So how did Jesus get clothed with this clothing, these garments? He clothed himself. That's what we must understand. He clothed himself with an absolutely white garment, glistening, gleaming, just like lightning, as we see. Well, you and I are to do the very same thing. We even see in Revelation chapter 19, we pick up in verse 11. Here's when Jesus is going to be coming back and bringing judgment. It says, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he hath judged and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. This is talking about Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. And what were they? They were clothed in fine linen. Now, when it says these guys were clothed in fine linen, white and clean, what about them? The same thing is true. Perfect tense, meaning they had clothed themselves in the past with present effects at the time of speaking. Middle voice means that these ones, the armies coming in heaven, which is those who are with the Lord, have been gone through the marriage of the Lamb. That's the church that has come to be with Him. They are the ones who are clothed with the fine linen, white and clean. And middle voice again, they did it for themselves. That shows you just as God girds himself, Jesus girded himself and clothed himself, you and I must clothe ourselves as well with fine linen and white and clean. We go back to verse 7. When it speaks about the marriage of the Lamb, time for that to come. This is when the rapture of the church will occur and then the marriage of the Lamb will occur at that time in heaven. Revelation 19, 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, that's the bride, that's, that's the church, has made herself ready. She's prepared herself and made herself ready. And then verse 8, To her it was granted or given that she should be arrayed, but this is really not the best translation, that she might be arrayed would be a better way to translate it. The reason why we say that is because this is a subjunctive mood. Now, if you're here for the first time, don't be overwhelmed by a lot of this if you've never heard anything about this, but it's essential to understand this. We explain it all to you so you will understand it. The subjunctive mood is important in the Greek. It's not speaking a fact that's in existence. It is a conditional statement, a statement made that's dependent upon conditions being met. So that he might, she might be arrayed, and she's to do this for herself again, the middle voice. She's responsible to do this. Conditions have to be met to do this. In fine linen, clean, pure, and again, white and shining, brilliant. And what's the fine linen? It says here about the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, when it speaks of this righteousness, this particular word here happens to be a word which is, an, is in the Greek, it is talking about righteous acts. Young's brings out the exact meaning of this particular word. It means righteous acts or the righteous deeds of the saints. When you look at Freiburg's, which is a lexicon, it speaks of it as righteous deeds. And when the Laonida speaks of it as acting justly, right, or just action. Other translations have translated it righteous deeds or righteous acts, which is what it is. So, she should be clothing herself or arrayed in these garments of fine linen, which is the righteous deeds and righteous acts of the church, which produces what? Cause them to be clean and to be white. That's what you and I must become if we are going to be with the Lord and we have come to the place of the marriage with the Lamb. So we see in every case, not only God, Jesus, the church, the church that's with Him, they all have come to the place that they have 
put on these garments of God, they put on this clothing that is white, that means we're pure and holy, bright, shining, righteous deeds, producing holiness in our life. And that's what he wants. Of course, how are we going to get to the place of being those ones who are having this righteousness? Remember, 1 John chapter 3, we've looked at in the past, for you haven't seen it, verse 7. Little children, no, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. If you're doing righteousness, you're doing righteous acts, righteous deeds. You're doing the word of righteousness. And when it says doeth, this is a present tense verb. Present tense in the, in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. This is why Young's translates it. This is Young's literal translation, the best New Testament translation that I know of, is doing, who is doing the righteousness. That means that you are righteous if you are doing righteousness. That's the fine linen, the righteousness of the saints, and that's what produces you to come to the place of being clean and pure and holy before the Lord. And we can see that further. It's been shown forth in Romans. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not to whom, that's a spiritual authority over you, but to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin, and if you're yielding to sin, you'd be yielding to the devil. What's it produce? Death. Or of obedience. What's obedience? Obedience to who? To the Lord. Obedience to what? The word of righteousness. You're obedient to the word. What does that produce? That produces righteousness in your life. This is what God wants. Verse 19. We are told now to yield our members, all of our faculties, servants to righteousness if we're obedient to the word. What does that produce? Holiness. Otherwise, we must be holy. That's the ones who are clean and pure and holy before the Lord. This is what God is going to accomplish in the body of Christ. The ones are going to be with Jesus. So believers are to clothe themselves by doing the word of righteousness, righteous acts, righteous deeds, to be pure and clean and white and, and prepared and ready for the marriage of the Lamb. Absolutely important. So, what are we to do to be clothing ourselves? How do, what do we do? What are we to clothe ourselves with? And how are we supposed to do this? You're going to be put on, you're putting on the garments of God, the spiritual clothing of the Lord, which you put on through the Word of God. How do we do this? We are responsible to do this. We are to clothe ourselves, putting these spiritual clothes upon us. And the Word shows us how we do this. At the same time, we're also told that we must put off things that are not of the Lord. You've got to put off filthy garments and things that are not of Him. Because you're not going to be clean and pure and white if you haven't put these things off. So our clothing of ourselves it actually begins with the time when we get born again. We see this in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, down in verse 27. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, when it talks about being baptized into Christ, this is talking about when you come into relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ because you've come into Jesus Christ. Now, when it says baptized, this particular word is a passive voice. Now, these things are important to understand what's being said. The passive voice means the subject, which is us, as being acted upon by somebody else. In other words, we, when we have been baptized, someone else has done this action to bring us into Christ. Who's that? That's the Lord. That's the work of the Holy Spirit who brings us into that. But notice what it says after this. That then we have put on, which is the word enduo again, which means to clothe oneself, and this one is very interesting because it's still talking about you, the subject, have put on Christ. And now it's not talking about a passive any longer. 
Now it's talking about a middle voice, meaning in this case, this verb means says, you do it for your benefit. So it's essentially saying you've been baptized into Christ and God brought you into Christ because of passive voice by the work of the Holy Spirit. And when that's happened, you yourself, through your action for your benefit, have clothed yourself with Christ. Well, how does all this work? First of all, what kind of a baptism is this talking about? There are different, there's two different baptisms that are spoken of in the Word of God. Remember, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, it speaks of the doctrine of baptisms, plural. There is a baptism by the Holy Spirit, and then there is a baptism with water. They are different. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what brings you into the body of Christ. That is what this is talking about, not a baptism with water. Baptism with water is what you do after you're born again, showing forth what happened already on the inside of you. We see this baptism by the Holy Spirit spoke of in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. What body is that? The body of Christ. How do we come into the body of Christ? When we're born again. What kind of a baptism is it speaking here? A baptism by one Spirit, that's the baptism by the Holy Spirit, which is what brings us into the body of Christ when we are born again. Now, Galatians 3.27 was speaking about us being baptized in a passive voice, and this one also is speaking the same thing, that we're all baptized passive voice in the same manner, into one body. They're talking about the same thing. The baptism into Christ in Galatians 3.27 is the same thing it's talking about here, but it's more specific telling you what's, what's happening. It's a baptism by the Holy Spirit into one body, which is the body of Christ. Now, how all does that happen? Through the new birth. When you get born again and receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, you are receiving Jesus and what happens? You get a brand new spirit on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit comes and immerses you. You're immersed in His presence. That's the baptism. That's what the word baptize means. It means to immerse or submerge in the presence of something. And He takes the old spirit out and puts the new spirit in, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's passive voice in those cases. And this is actually the fulfillment of the reconciliation work that is to happen in every one of our lives because of what Jesus has done. 2 Corinthians 5.18 All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. The word reconciled is a word which means brought the change or the exchange. He brought the exchange. And then it goes on and says, and is given unto us the ministry of Reconciliation. What does reconciliation mean? It means exchange. What exchange is occurring? The exchanging of the old spirit that was not right for a brand new spirit, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ that comes into us. The old spirit's taken out, eliminated. A new spirit comes into us. This is when we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Now let's go back to Galatians for a moment, though, because we need to answer something. We see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, passive voice, God does the work, brings us into the body of Christ, brings us into Christ as we see. But at the same time, it says that through this, we actually put on, clothe ourselves for our benefit, middle voice, Christ. So, that means you and I have a part to play in this. What do we do in clothing ourselves to put on Christ to see this baptism by the Holy Spirit be performed, bringing us into Christ and giving us a brand new spirit? In other words, this is passive voice baptized into Christ, but this part is putting on, which is middle voice, which means something you and I do. What do we do? We do one thing. We receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he the power, or this means the authority, 
to become, not the sons, it's the word technon, which means children. The word sons is huios in the Greek. This is technon, children of God. Even Young's didn't pick up on this one. He usually does a good job. Gave him authority to become the children of God. Now, when you become a child of God, how do you become a child? When you get born, right? How do you become a child of God? When you're born of God. So how do we get born of God? When we receive Him. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He gives you the authority to become a child of God. The baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs. You're immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The exchange occurs. The old spirit is taken out. And a brand new spirit comes on the inside of you. And what's the result? You are now a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The word creature really means a cr one who is creation, something that's been created. The act of creating something, a new creation, because you are a new creation. You've got a brand new spirit on the inside of you. The great exchange has occurred, and you have the spirit of Christ now dwelling in you. So, that shows you that in the beginning work of you clothing yourselves with the things of God, the garments of God, you have a part to play, which is to receive Jesus, which is putting on, clothing yourself with Christ for your benefit that is accomplished by the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we see another thing. We need to also then receive the Holy Spirit. And we want to take you to a scripture we looked at a moment ago, but bring this up also and answer something that's also important. You see, many people have taught out there that when you're born again, you got the Holy Spirit at the same time. Not true. One of the reasons why they say that is because of this verse, failing to understand what is being said. Remember, it says we're baptized into one body, and that was a passive voice, meaning the Holy Spirit is doing that. And then it goes on, says whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and we've all been made to drink into one spirit. Not a good translation. Most all the translations say made to, but it's not really what it means. It means give to drink, given to drink, more literally. We've all been given to drink because we have a part to play, as you will see in a moment, into one spirit. But when you look up this word, you find that this is also here a passive voice, which means we're not doing something in this verse, as far as it says, to drink into one spirit, which is when the Holy Spirit comes into you. Instead, Somebody else is doing this because it's a passive voice performing this, bringing us into one spirit, which who is who? The Holy Spirit. And how does that happen? Well, that happens because what is drinking all about? John chapter 7 tells us what drinking's about. In verse 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He's talking about drinking. And when he's talking about you coming and drinking, this is a command. This is an active voice, meaning you are going to do this. Now, what's he talking about? Verse 39 tells you what he's talking about. This spake ye of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him, this is believers that are born again, it says here, should receive. Or are to be received. More literally, it means, we should back up a moment. Not should, but this means, this is a word mellow in the Greek, and it really means in this context, intending. Those that believe on him, intending, to receive the Holy Spirit, intending to receive. Otherwise, it hadn't happened yet, but it was intending that we were to receive the Holy Spirit. Why, why couldn't they yet? Because the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. It wasn't a time yet. But here, when it talks about the intending that we, for the receiving of this, this is talking about an active voice, meaning 
you and I, is what the subject is, those who believe are going to actively be taking the Holy Spirit into us. And this isn't this exactly what happens over in Acts, in cha Acts chapter 8. We pointed out before that in the verse 5 that Philip preached Christ to those at Samaria. Verse 6, the people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. They got born again. They also were hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. Verse 12, they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. They were baptized, both men and women. That's water baptism after they've been born again. So these guys are born again and been baptized with water. Now what? Verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now what are they coming down to do? To minister something further to them. When they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive, the people might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, is this talking about a passive thing, that God's just going to do this automatically to you? No. Active voice. They do it. And is this automatically going to happen? No, because it's a subjunctive mood, meaning that it's conditional upon them acting on the Word to receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, you don't the Holy Spirit doesn't come into you when you're born again. It is received after you're born again, and you are to actively take the Holy Spirit into you, and it's conditional upon you doing it. It doesn't automatically happen. They came down to pray for them that they might, if they met the conditions, take the Holy Spirit into them. Of course, that means they had to be born again and act on that and receiving the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what happened. We know the Holy Spirit hadn't come into them because verse 16 says, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. It hadn't happened yet. They were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them and they received. This is the people. Received the Holy Ghost. Now, is this passive voice that it just came into them without any action on their part? No. Active voice. This, again, shows that the receiving of the Holy Spirit is something that you do. It is after you are born again. And that is very important. Now, people, as we mentioned, just go back to this for a moment, misunderstanding this and not looking at all the scriptures People have made the assumption because this, remember, all made to drink or have been given to drink would be better understood because that's exactly what it means. See, if it's made to drink, it sounds like it just automatically happens to you and you do nothing about it. No. You've been given to drink. Again, the Holy Spirit is going to do it passive. So because of that, this is how people have come up with a belief that the Holy Spirit came into you when you got baptized with the Holy Spirit and were born again. Not so. This is simply telling you the Holy Spirit is going to do it, but remember the drinking was actively taken by you when you received the Holy Spirit to come into you. So, we get born again, we put on Christ, we begin to put God's clothes on. We got a new spirit. We begin to get the things of God in us. We have we received the Holy Spirit, to come to dwell on the inside of us. We have drunk this into us. We brought, again, something more that's of God that comes into us. Now the Holy Spirit then is going to begin to work in our life through the Word of God as we do what the Word says, to put on God's clothes. But there's also, as we mentioned, you have to put off a whole lot of things as well. We see in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 3. Look what it says here. Joshua, he's the high priest, was clothed with filthy garments. Filthy garments. Those things you've got to get rid of. And stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. The filthy garments have to be taken away from you and from me. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. That means when the filthy garments are taken, then the iniquity will pass from you. By the way, when it tells you to take away the filthy garments, this was a command, imperative mood. It wasn't a nice suggestion. You 
and I are commanded, as you will see in the New Testament, to take away everything that is filthy. It has to be eliminated out of your life. It's anything that is unclean. When the, the filthy garments, all of them, are taken, then it will cause the iniquity to pass from you. Now, what does that mean? Well, the iniquity, remember, is that which causes the curses to come upon you. Because when you sin, it produces iniquity, which is of the heart. And it's the iniquities that bring curses upon you. We know that. This is the word, number 5771, alone in the Hebrew. And an example of this scene, how these iniquities affect us. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18, where it says, The Lord's long suffering, a great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of own, of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. These are inherited generational curses coming down the line because of the iniquities of the forefathers. And remember, there's a cause for every curse, and there's an enforcement of the curse, which is the demons that come in from the open door of sin. So you have to deal with the sin, and you also have to deal with the cause, which are the evil spirits that come into you. And that's all part of the, filthy, the filthiness that has to be eliminated from you. So, we go back to Zechariah chapter 3, and verse 4. The filthy garments, all of them, that would include the evil spirits as well as all the evil things of sin and works of the flesh and anything that's not of God, has to be taken from you. That will cause the iniquity to pass, which means the curses will be broken. But there's also something else that must happen. Many people just try to get delivered of their problem, but they don't do what's necessary to see, them, see God bring forth what he purposes, his promises, the change in their life, and to bring forth the character of Jesus Christ, accomplish all these things. What has to happen? He says, I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. You've got to get clothed. God says you'll do this. And when it talks about this change of raiment, this is one Hebrew word only used two times. And it means the robe of state. And what it's talking about is talking about a high priestly robe. The high priestly robe. Young's translates it costly apparel, but it's better understand it's like a costly robe, which is the, what the high priest had. It's a priestly robe. This is what you're to have. God will clothe you with the priestly, lo, priestly robe. The reason is, this is talking about, remember, this is the high priest here. And he's getting the priest robe put upon him. Because he's got these filthy garments. He can't have the priest robe on him until he gets rid of the filthy garments, get the iniquity out, and gets, he's going to get clothed with these priestly garments. Well, that's exactly what God is going to do with you. He's going to bring you the priestly garments. Remember, we are kings and priests now when we're born again, and we are to be build our, building ourselves a spiritual house by the priestly garments being put on through the Word of God in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 tells us this was filthiness. We've got to get rid of all the filthy garments. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. When it says here about cleansing ourselves, this is a subjunctive mood verb. That we might cleanse ourselves if we meet the conditions. We've got to do it. From what? All. Filthiness. These are all these filthy garments. And where do these garments come from? The filthiness of the flesh, every fleshly work, as well as of the spirit. Filthiness is modifying of the flesh and of the spirit. What's the spiritual filthiness? Evil spirits that are in us. In other words, you've got to get rid of every filthy fleshly thing out of your life. And you also got to get rid of every filthy evil spirit out of your life. What's that going to do? That's going to perfect holiness in the fear of God, which is what God is going to bring us to. Therefore, we have to put away all the filthiness. And as you get rid of all the filthy garments, it will break the curses and the iniquity will pass. But also you've got to put on the garments of the priest. You've got to put on God's clothes and become 
like Jesus, essentially, because remember, he's the high priest today, and we're going to become like him. Genesis, chapter 35. Verse 1. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. What's Bethel? Bethel means the house of God. That's why it's important to come to church, to hear the word of God. And dwell there. You should be coming as often as you can. And make there an altar unto God. That's where you worship God. He wants you to be worshiping him. That, that, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And then he says to his household and all that are with him, put away the strange gods. Anything that's of idolatry, <laughs> anything that you were looking to as a source, because a god is something that you look to as a source, anything you looked at as a source prior, get rid of it. God's got to be your total source. Remember, he's a jealous God. He'll have no other gods before him. And be clean. They were supposed to be, become the place of being clean. And when it says be clean, this is a commanding statement because it's an imperative mood. But it also has to, is in the hithpeal stem. The hithpeal stem is what's called reflexive in the Hebrew, meaning that it's similar to like our middle voice that we've described in the Greek. You're doing it for your own benefit. You're doing it for yourself. This is why Young's does a good job here. He translates it, cleanse yourselves for your benefit. So, we've got to get rid of all the idolatry, anything as a source other than the Lord. You've got to cleanse yourself. It's your responsibility to cleanse yourself from all this filthiness of flesh and spirit. You cast out all the demons and you get rid of all the fleshly works. And then he also says, you're going to change your garments. You're going to have a change of clothes now. It's absolutely necessary for us to do this. And when he talks about here, about cleansing yourself and bringing forth this changing your, of your garments again, this again is an imperative mood. These are commands. These are not just nice little suggestions. It's mandatory that you cleanse yourselves. It is mandatory that you change your garments. Get rid of the filthy garments and get the garments of God on. You are going to clothe yourself and put these things on in your life. You must get rid of them. Because when it speaks about the judgments that are going to come, in one statement we want to make a note of in Zephaniah 1 verse 8, it will come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such that are clothed with strange apparel, foreign apparel. You're going to get punished if you're clothed with strange apparel. You've got to get rid of it. You can't have anything that's strange apparel that's not of God. You've got to get rid of all of these things out of your life. We come to Numbers chapter 8. In Numbers chapter 8, we pick up verse 6. Take the Levites from among the children of Israel. Who are the Levites? They were the priests. What are you and I today? The priests. So this would speak to us from a New Testament application. And what? Cleanse them. They again are to be cleansed. These priests, they're to be cleansed. And when it talks about the peel stem, it's talking about some, that's, that's an intensive stem. It's intensive. It means an intensive work being accomplished in the Hebrew. So it's going to be an intensive cleansing. Not just, oh, I'll try to get rid of a few things here and there. No, intensive cleansing. You are going to be cleansing yourself. You're going to be working out your own salvation. You are going to get rid of all of the things that are not of the Lord. Thus shall you do unto them to cleanse them. You're going to sprinkle the water of purifying. This is the purification to bring you cleanse from all sin, the purification from sins this is speaking of. How does that happen? Through the word of God working in your life. They were to shave all their flesh. That speaks of cutting off all of the works of the flesh. All the works of the flesh have to be cut off, put away, and eliminated. And let them, meaning our responsibility, the priests in this case, which would be us, wash their clothes. And this word wash is the word kabas in the Hebrew, 
which is the washing performed by the work of the fuller. It's pronounced fuller, not fuller. It looks like it, but it's fuller. What's the fuller's work? To cleanse you as white as snow, that there's nothing, no impurities whatsoever. So, and who's to do that again? You and I are to wash our clothes, everything in our lives to be washed, pure. And what's that going to do? So, making themselves clean. That's what he wants. And then we come to Exodus chapter 19. In Exodus chapter 19, we see prophetic statements concerning the end time church and also, of course, what was going to happen at the time of when Jesus Christ brought the new covenant into being. Here's when the children of Israel had gone forth out of the land of Egypt. And we come down to verse 5. And the prophecy was spoken to them. He said, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. In the Old Testament, who were the priests? Just one tribe, the tribe of Levi. He's speaking to all the people. He's not speaking just to one group. So he's telling them all, you're all going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That is the church. When the church age comes into being after Jesus brought the new covenant into being. So this is a prophecy that everybody was going to be a kingdom of priests and a part of this holy nation. Well, what needed to happen? And this is also during the church age. The reason you know this, because after the Lord had spoke to Moses about what he was to tell the people, he said, go into the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. Two days. Why two days? Because that's the church age. Two days. A day is as a thousand years. Remember, there are seven days in creation. Six days man had control, so he gave it into the hands of Satan, until the seventh day when Jesus is going to take back control and he's going to rule for a thousand years. Four thousand years were till Christ came and accomplished the redemption. That's the first four days. The next two days are the church age. That is the 2,000 years which we are fast approaching the end of. We're not to the end of it, remember. That doesn't end until 2030. So, go to the people, sanctify them, get them consecrated and purified and become holy today and tomorrow for the two days of the church age. And let them, that's all the people in the church age, kabos their clothes, work the work of a fuller, cleansed, white as snow, your clothes. You have to get totally cleansed. So we come down to verse 14. So Moses went down from the mount of the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. God's not going to do it for you. You're going to do it. Same thing, kabas. You are going to be involved in this washing and this is through the Word of God as you're putting on the garments of God and you're getting rid of all the evil, all the filthiness. All the filthy garments have to be eliminated. Now in Exodus chapter 28, talking about the high priest and the priests. Exodus 28 verse 2, You'll make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. The garments that were to be put on him were holy garments. And the purpose was, so that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. You've got to be holy if you're going to minister for the Lord as a priest. And this was not only to happen for Aaron, who was the high priest, but also was happened to all of his sons, who were the priests as well. The holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed there and to be consecrated in them as well. So all that were priests, were supposed to have these holy garments to be consecrated unto them. And that all comes down to us because we are priests today. We have to be, have holy garments. We have to have, be consecrated unto the service of the Lord. Then we come to Isaiah, chapter 52. And Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 1. 
Awake, awake. He wants everybody to wake up. Get with the program. Put on thy strength. This means to clothe yourself. Put on clothing. Put on your strength, O Zion. Meaning, it doesn't get, strength won't come into you unless you put it on. You put it on through the word of God. O Zion, put on thy beautiful, beautiful garments. And that's going to be the things of the word of God. The garments of God. The holy garments of God. O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised. What does that speak of? Something that's not in covenant relationship with God. Don't let the uncircumcised that aren't in covenant with God come into you anymore. Who are you supposed to have fellowship with and walk with? People that are in covenant relationship. Not with the ungodly. You preach the gospel to them and call them to repentance, but this is not who you ha come and have fellowship with. And you don't let these guys come into you. Or the unclean. Well, that would include anybody that's unclean, including believers or people in covenant who are unclean. Otherwise, we can't be fellowshipping with people that are not in covenant, and we can't be fellowshipping with anybody that's unclean even. God wants you to understand He is raising up a holy nation, a holy church, which is the body of Christ that is going to put on the garments of God, get rid of all the filthiness, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and become like Him. And then he goes on and says, Shake thyself from the dust, arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Get free of all this captivity. You're to loose this captivity off of your life. We can all do that in the New Testament. We have authority and dominion. We can cast out every devil. We can break every bondage. All cap captivity can be absolutely eliminated in your life. And so we come to Isaiah 61. How's this going to happen? It's the fulfillment of what this verse is about, which Jesus brought it forth. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God's upon me. Uh, the Holy Spirit now working His ministry, which in the New Testament, Jesus brought the fulfillment of it in Luke 4 when He stood up and said this. Uh, the, so from here, He got the book of Isaiah and read this and said, this is fulfilled. This is, this is here. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings of the meek, the good news, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty of the captives, opening the prison to them that are bound. Deliverance, healing, freedom, coming out of captivity, that is what is to happen in your life. And this is to happen in the church age. Proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, where that's the year of Jubilee, where everybody goes free from bondage and restored back to everything that they had originally. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ has accomplished. And that's in His first coming. Remember, that's what he spoke in Luke 4. He stopped there because that's what he brought in the first coming. The day of vengeance of our God, that is what he brings in the second coming when he brings the judgment that is going to come upon the nations that have rejected him. Well, we come to verse 3. And this is what all he's going to bring. He's going to bring all these good things to you. Appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes. Oil of joy for mourning. We're going to have joy. No more mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You're going to put on all these things, see? That they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The trees of righteousness, that means they've been doing the word of righteousness, and they're bringing forth all this fruits of righteousness. The trees of righteousness bring forth fruits of righteousness. And that's because of the mighty work of the Lord being accomplished. And then we come down to verse 10. I will regret, greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. We're getting clothed with this garment. We're to clothe ourselves with the garments of salvation. As you will see in the New Testament, we do this. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. We put on that breastplate of righteousness through the word in us. And he, when he talks about the garments of salvation also, this word salvation, don't just think about it just being saved in the sense of being born again. It's this word yesha, which means deliverance, salvation, rescue, safety, welfare, prosperity, victory. It's total victory in all aspects of life. That's what he brings. You're to put on these garments. 
the garment of prosperity, the garment of, of victory, the garment of peace, the garment of salvation, the garment of safety, protection, all these things, everything that he has for you. Total victory in your life. You're to see these things be put on for you. That's what he wants for all of us. As we come over to Job, and we see other places it speaks of here in the Old Testament. Job 29, verse 14. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. As you put on righteousness, through doing the word of righteousness, as we saw in the New Testament, it will clothe you with righteousness. We see the priests are also, it's spoken of, that they're to be clothed with righteousness in Psalms 132. Psalms 132, verse 9. Let the priests, I would speak of all of us, be clothed with righteousness. Let the saints shout for joy because of seeing this mighty work of God being accomplished. We have tremendous joy because of what He's doing in our life. And then we also see down in verse 16, I will clothe her priest with salvation. Again, this is the same word, Yeshua, deliverance, rescue, safety, welfare, prosperity, victory, all these things. This is what he does for the priests, and that's for you and me as we meet the conditions and do what's necessary. What's going to happen to the enemies, though? The enemies are to be defeated. His enemies will like clothed with shame. That's right, they're going to be defeated. Shame and disgrace, essentially this is. Their shame and disgrace because of all the things they've done. Proverbs chapter 31. Here it's speaking about the virtuous woman. Every one of you women are to be virtuous women. Strength and honor are her clothing. God wants every one of you to be strong and to have honor before God because you put on the garments of God. You're walking in the ways of the Lord. You've accomplished all the things. In Proverbs 31, talking about the virtuous woman, you've met those conditions. Now, if we don't clothe ourselves, what will we be? We'll be naked before the Lord. And that's trouble. Deuteronomy 23, verse 14. It's really a prophetic statement regarding what God is doing in the end time church as well. For the Lord thy God walketh, this particular word walketh, is a participle. The participle is a like our present tense, meaning ongoing action. It's a pale stem, meaning he's doing it for himself. The Lord is walking for himself in the midst of the camp. That's a type of the church. He's coming for himself in the church to see who's going to walk in his ways and who's not. And he's coming to deliver you, to deliver you, and to give thine enemies before thee. Give or, or put the enemies before you so you can smite them all and destroy them. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. The church is to be holy. What happens if it's not holy? That he see no nakedness. It says unclean thing in thee, but it really says nakedness. Meaning, if he sees that you are naked, then that means you aren't clothed. Which means, if you haven't clothed yourself, then you must have filthy stuff still on you, and you're naked. You're in bondage to the enemy. You haven't done what's necessary. That he sees no naked thing, no nakedness in thee. What will happen if he sees nakedness? He'll turn away from you, and he will not manifest himself to you. Otherwise, God's going to manifest himself to those that are holy, that are clothed. You are to clothe yourself with the things of God. Someone who's naked means they haven't clothed themselves with the things of God. It means that obviously they're walking in the flesh, they're walking in sin, they're walking in the ways of the world. They're not doing what God says. This brings us to, and over in Luke. In Luke chapter 8, verse 27. 
This is the man who had all these demons that Jesus came in contact with, and he cast the demons out of them. He went forth to land, and when there met him out of the city, a certain man which had devils a long time, and he wore no clothes. Now, when it says, this is the word, a form of this kind of like in duo, but it's in disco, in the disco, and this is interesting, it is an imperfect tense, which means ongoing action in the past, means he was continually wearing no clothes. And notice, it's a middle voice, which means he was wearing no clothes for himself. He should have been wearing clothes for himself, but he was continually not wearing clothes for himself. He wasn't abiding in any house, he was in the tombs. This guy was not doing what he was supposed to do. He didn't clothe himself as he was supposed to. Well, what happens if you don't clothe yourself? You're naked, which means you're walking in the ways of sin. You're not holy before God. You're an open door. What happens when you walk in sin? The devils will come into you continually. And that's exactly what happened. Well, if you don't have the clothes of God on, you have no protection from the enemy's attacks and all the things he'll bring against you. This guy had loads of demons that were in him. If you haven't put on the garments of God to be clothed and you're walking naked, you must be walking in sin in the ways of the flesh and the ways of the world. And you're letting demons come into you. We come down to verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done. This is after the demons were cast out of him. And they came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. When it speaks of him sitting at the feet of Jesus here, well, that's a good thing. Present tense, ongoing action. And what does sitting at the feet of Jesus speak of? We'll come back here in a moment. Remember what you're doing when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus? Look about Mary. Luke 10, 39. Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. That means this guy in Luke chapter 8, after he, when he got delivered, this tells you some important things to, in order to see a person get delivered and get free. You must be sitting continually at the feet of Jesus, hearing the word of God. As you are doing that, you're getting the knowledge, and then you're to act upon it and do the word of God. And what's going to be the result of that? It says he was clothed. This is a perfect tense verb, meaning the action had been completed with present effects. Meaning, this guy is implying that you sit continually at the feet of Jesus and hear the word, and you're obviously putting it in operation because the action gets completed that you put on the clothes of God because you're a doer of it. With ongoing actions, with it speaking at the time of speaking, that it's, it's, still, it's been accomplished. Perfect tense means action completed with, at the time of speaking, it's still in effect. So, as you're hearing the word of God continually and hearing and doing it, you're clothing yourself. And that is supposed to be action that gets accomplished and stays in you, which is what the perfect tense really focuses on, what's being said now. He's in that state. And he's in his right mind. He comes in his right mind. He has a sound mind because what's happened? He's gotten his mind renewed to the truth, as well as the demons cast out. See, just because you have the demons cast out, but you don't get the word in you, are you still in your right mind? No. The only way you're in your right mind is when you have the word in you. You've got to have the word in you and be walking in line with the word of God. In other words, this is a revelation of what must happen. You get the demons cast out. You get the word in you. You be a doer of this and incorporate it into your lifestyle and get clothed with the garments of God so it's gone ongoing work completed and in effect at the time of speaking or whenever we're looking at your life and you have come to the place of being in your right mind, meaning you're not going to give place to the devil anymore. You're going to be walking in line with the word of God. That is what he wants for you in your life.
Hebrews chapter 12. Remember, we've got to get rid of all the evil stuff and put on the good stuff. Get rid of all the filthy and put on the garments of God. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, this is the word which really means put off, you are to put off every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. These are things we've got to put off. You've got to put off, put away any weight, anything that would be burden or hindering you, anything that's blocking you, anything that's hindering you from doing what God wants. There's no excuses, remember. You can't say, well, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got all these other things I've got to do. <laughs> no. You get rid of all those weights, anything that is hindering you. And also, the sin which so easily besets us. Now, this word, particularly word, or uh, besetting here, is a word which actually means in the Greek, standing well around you. Stat it comes from statos, about stand. Peri means around. You, E-U, means well. That's why this word came, this word, you, per, estatos. Standing well around you, meaning... <laughs> It's been operating, continuing in your life, and you obviously haven't dealt with it, and it's got you in bondage. It's been controlling you. You've got to get rid of this thing. You cannot let any sins continue in your life. You ought to get rid of them all. Remember, sin has no dominion over you. You've got to put all these things off. Also, we come down to James 1, verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart, put off, put aside, get rid of this. And by the way, when it's telling you these things, this is for your benefit. You got to put it off for you. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. You got to put off for you what? All filthiness. All this filthiness. All the filthy garments, all the filthy works of the flesh, all the filthy evil spirits, they all got to be cast out. You got to get rid of it all. And this superfluity or abundance of evil, naughtiness, which is, refers to any kind of ill will, any kind of malice, any kind of evilness that you've had towards others. And, of course, what else? You get rid of the bad stuff, but that's not where we stop. Then you receive with meekness the engrafted, this means the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Because you've got to get the word in you that's going to produce the salvation of the Lord in the soulish realm. See? And so as you get the word in you, what are you to be doing? But it says become, not be. It's the word ginomai in the Greek, become. So as you're receiving the word, what are you going to do? You're to become. And this is an imperative mood. This is a command. It's not a good suggestion. Become. Because it, it happens as you hear and do and hear and do and hear and do, consistently incorporate it in everything into your lifestyle. Present tense. Become continually doers of the word. It's mandatory. And not hearers only. Or deceiving your own selves. If you don't become a consistent doer of the word, you will deceive yourself and the devil doesn't even have to do much with you. Because you've already done it to yourself. He'll take the word out because you have to do the word in order to retain it. You must be doers of the word consistently. So you put off the bad and you put on the good things of God. You become a doer of the word. That's how you are putting on the garments of God in your life. You've got to lay aside everything. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside, putting off again. When he's talk, talking this putting off, again, it's a middle voice, putting off for yourself all malice, all guile, any deceit, all hypocrisies. You can't be a hypocrite. Act one way around people and then act a different way other times. Envies, all evil speakings. That means any kind of wrong, evil speaking coming out of your mouth. If you open your mouth, it better be good words or things that edify, bring grace, or speaking forth in line with the Word of God, not any evil speakings. It all has to go. And he says, as newborn babes desire 
or long for and desire and pursue after. The, this is, refers to the unmixed, pure milk of the word that you might grow, not that you automatically will grow. Just because you've heard the word doesn't mean you're going to grow. A lot of Christians have heard the word and they've gone nowhere because they haven't done it. This is why it's a subjunctive mood. It means it's a, it's a, it has to be met the conditions, a conditional statement. That you might grow thereby. How are you going to grow? Because you do it. You put it in operation in your life and carry it out. Also, everything that's not of the Lord has to be gotten rid of. We've got to lay aside all these things. Jude verse 23. Others say with fear, pull him out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The flesh does what? The word spotted means defiled. If you have any works of the flesh in your life, you're defiled. Your garments are defiled. You're not holy. You're not white and clean as we're to be. We're to be holy before the Lord. And to anybody who's gone the wrong direction and backslid or not walking right, well, they, they got to come to repentance and come back, confess their sin, get right. Remember, this is the prodigal son. When he came back and he confessed to the, you know, his sin to the father, he sinned against the father in heaven. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Clothe him with this and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. That means if you have not been walking right, you can be restored if you'll repent and come back and start walking right. Because he will put on, he'll clothe you with all, give you the best robe. This is the robe worn by kings and priests. Ah, you're going to be restored. It's not like you're doomed because you went off and went in the wrong direction. And put it on him. Meaning, it's a command. Clothe him. You got to get clothed. You got to get this thing, this, this priestly robe has to be put on you and clothed upon you. It's a command. And this is all a type of the Father speaking to one who comes back to the Lord. You've got to get these clothes on or you're going to be in trouble. You'll be right back out in the filth again if you don't get the clothing of God on. You've got to walk in the ways of the Lord and follow Him. In battle, we have to make sure that we have put on the spiritual armor of God. Remember about David? First Samuel chapter 38, when Saul, Saul's a man after the flesh, David's a man after the spirit. Saul armed David with his armor. He put on a helmet of brass upon his head and he armed him with a coat of mail. That's not going to work. David girded his sword up upon his armor and said to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. I've not proved them. And David put them off. Instead, he took the things that God had given him because he was in covenant relationship and he went forth based on the covenant, and saw, of course, the enemies be smitten when he did what God wanted. You must get rid. You can't do things in the natural or in the flesh. You try to do things with any kind of means other than the spiritual armor of God, you go nowhere. Isaiah, chapter 59. In Isaiah, chapter 59, we pick up over in verse 17. This is the intercessor. And what is he doing? Verse 17. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, helmet of salvation upon his head. That's like the armor of God in the New Testament. He put on garments of vengeance because you are going to fight and bring God's vengeance against his enemies. For clothing. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. That's what he wants. You're going to enter into warfare to destroy the enemies. And you're going to have zeal. You can't be lazy and passive. You've got to get zealous in the warfare and be diligent. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he'll pay recompense. That's right. You're going to enter into spiritual warfare and conquer the enemies. And even if the enemy comes against you, God will take care of him. Verse 19, they fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rise of the sun. Because when you speak in the name of the Lord, that's going to release His authority. 
And his glory is going to be manifest when you has the power of his glory, remember, when the word of God is being put forth, the power of God out of you, and you speak in the name of the Lord. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, here is a counterattack against you, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. What does that mean? The word lift up a standard. You have to look up the stems or you'll never understand it. The stem is the polel stem. Here is the polel stem. It means to drive at. The Spirit of the Lord will drive at him, attack him, as you put him in operation, and he'll conquer the counterattacks from the enemy. You can overcome all of the works of the enemy, but you've got to have the armor on. You've got to have the garments of God on, as we see. This brings us over to the New Testament. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. That's the Holy Spirit that was going to come into him, and it did. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem. This really means to abide, not tarry, but to sit down and fix your abode, essentially. Young's does a good job of translating this. Fix your abode. It's a command that they were supposed to do this in the city of Jerusalem until you be in duo, clothing yourself again, middle voice, subjunctive mood, conditional statement, that you might clothe yourself, middle voice means you're doing it for yourself, from, with power from on high. Because once you receive the Holy Spirit, you are then to clothe yourself with power from on high. We can see this further, shown in Acts. A lot of people have not understood this because they never looked up the words, and they don't understand the Greek, and so they make all these false doctrines. It's usually because they don't have accurate understanding why we see this. Acts 1.8. Let's we'll read it the way people mostly think. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Most people conclude, oh, I got power since the Holy Ghost has come upon me. The power's here. I got the power. It's not what it says at all. You shall, it didn't say you have received power. It says you shall, lambano, take hold of power. You are to take hold of power. It's a future tense. Not that you already have. You shall take hold of power, dunamis, when? After the Holy Ghost is coming upon you, or this is a participle, the Holy Ghost having come upon you. Otherwise, once you have the Holy Spirit, now you're to take hold of the power of God. And how do you take this power? Well, you take hold of the power by doing what the Word says in Ephesians chapter 6 with the armor of God. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, talking to the church, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This is a word and dunamo. Dunamis means power. En, the prefix, means in. So this is talking about power within. And when it's talking about be empowered within, this is an imperative mood command. So God is commanding here to be empowered within. At the same time, it says it's present tense, so it's supposed to be continuous, ongoing action. You're to be continually empowered within, ongoing. At the same time, though, as it's a command, it's a passive voice. The passive voice, that means the fact that somebody else is doing the action. Oh, that mean, but he's, how, wait a minute, how can he, we be commanded to do something, and yet we're not doing it? Because somebody else is doing it. Who's doing it? The Lord is doing it. Because there's something that we have to do. 
yet it's a command to see this happen. In other words, God is not going to get this done unless we've obeyed the command. There's another command on top of this that you'll see which causes this command to be fulfilled. We'll see it in a moment. And in the power, this is the word kratos, which is a manifested power of his iscus, mighty force. His mighty force. So he's commanding us to be inwardly empowered within and manifesting power out of us with mighty force. That's essentially what it's saying. And yet God's going to do this. The power is coming from him. And it's coming into us from him. And it's coming out of us from him. Well, how do we get this in us since we've been commanded to do this? Here's where it comes to our part. Put on. This is the same word and duo we've seen many times. Imperative mood. This is a command, and this time it's a command to you and to me for our benefit because it's a middle voice, meaning the subject is doing this. So understood subject would be you, which is all of us. Believers, you're commanded to, be, to put on for yourself, middle voice, the whole armor of God. In doing that, you see the command of God bringing in power on the inside of you and being able to manifest out of you with mighty force. Now again, this word is the word to clothe yourself. You're going to clothe yourself with the whole armor of God. How is that done? Through the word in you. And what's going to be the result? That you may be able, you might, may have this power, to have the power, in present tense, it really means to, to have the power, it's infinitive, to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then he goes on and says, why do we need to do this? Why do we have to engage in this? Because it says we wrestle not, or our wrestling, this wrestling we have, is not against flesh and blood, but it's against all these evil spirits, against the principalities, against the authorities, it means, the rulers of the darkness of this aeon, age, and the spiritual wickedness in high places. You and I are engaged in warfare against spiritual powers operating in the heavenlies. Wherefore, take unto you. Now, when it says take unto you, again, is that God doing that? No. Active voice, meaning you are taking unto you. Imperative mood, command that God is commanding you and me. You're commanded to take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, that's when the devil shows up, and having done all, to stand. Now, how are you going to be able to do it? Every part of the armor involves the Word of God in you. The Word in you is so important. He says, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, that's the Word in your heart, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Word directing your steps, taking the shield of faith, able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That's you speaking the word to deal with any attacks of the enemy coming against you. Helmet of salvation, the word in renewing your mind. Sword of the spirit, which is the rhema, spoken word you speak forth, using your sword to smite the enemies and destroy them. So it's the word in you in all these areas. And as the word is in you, then you're going to have the power of God resident within you and it will be able to be manifest out of you with mighty force as you do what? As you're praying with all different types of prayer. That's what this is referring to. All prayer, all different types. Manifesting, releasing the power of God as you're praying the word or acting on the word in some capacity. Remember that teaching that says you get up in the morning and pray to put the armor of God on? It's a lie. It's a false teaching. You don't pray to put the armor of God on. You put the armor of God on through the Word, and then you pray with it on to release the power of God out of you. All those people that teach pray to put the armor of God on the, in, the, in the morning and you get up is all error, and it does nothing whatsoever because that's not what the Word says. You pray once you already have that armor on. Now, a couple more scriptures before we stop from today until to tonight. We see in Romans chapter 13, verse 12. What are we doing? We're going to cast off, get rid of it, put off the works of darkness. And we're going to put on, 
same thing, clothe ourselves, that you might clothe yourself. It's conditional. It doesn't have automatic. You've got to do it. Middle voice, for your own benefit, the armor of light. And what actually is happening? In verse 14, it says, Put ye on, clothe yourself. And this again is the middle voice, or excuse me, imperative mood, command, and it's a middle voice, meaning you are putting on for yourself, God commands you to put on for on yourself the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning, the clothing that you're putting on of the Word of God on you is putting the Lord Jesus Christ on in you and on you. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the loss thereof. God wants us to understand. We must put on the armor of God. We must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We put on the Word of God in all these different ways. And we're going to put off all the things that are not of Him. It is absolutely necessary for you to clothe yourself with the garments of God, clothing yourself just like God clothed himself, Jesus clothed himself, come white as snow, got rid of all the anything, and, and he, no filthiness whatsoever could be on him. He had the, he, every temptation that came against him. He conquered every single one. He was tempted at all points without sin, remember? Well, now you and I can conquer every enemy because sin has no dominion over us, and we are to clothe ourselves with the garments of God, to become like Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing in your life. Which means you've got to put off all this stuff that's not of the Lord. Otherwise, remember, if you have all this uncleanness, you're not holy, God's going to turn away from you and he considers you naked. No, we've got to be clothed. We're going to be clothed so that we walk in the ways of the Lord and we manifest the power of God. We bring forth the promises we obtain everything, the full salvation of the Lord. We are shown to be righteous before Him. And we're going to be holy, the holy people of God. That is what He's accomplishing in your life as you're doing the Word. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank You and praise You for the Word of God that brings revelation that I must be clothed with the whole armor of God, all the garments of God, everything of the Word of God. And I must put off everything that is filthy, that is not of the Lord. I will clothe myself in obedience to the Word of God, with the garments of God, which is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will get rid of all filthy garments, every filthy thing. I will cast out, I will put it off. I will not have it in my life. I will only walk in the ways of righteousness and have be holy, white as snow, like the fooler, no spots whatsoever. I thank you, Lord, that as I am clothing myself with the garments of God, I will put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we saw in Revelation, I will have made myself ready for the marriage of the Lamb, having met the conditions to be one of the righteous ones. I thank you. I will be a doer of this word, and I will clothe myself with the garments of God and get rid of and put away all filthiness in every area of my life. I thank you. As I do the word, you accomplish it in my life because you're a performer of it. Thank you for bringing this to pass as I hear and do this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. This is essential for us. Otherwise, you won't be in the marriage of the Lamb. It's essential for us, for you to be saved, essentially. I mean, somebody is filthy and holy, or not holy, ungodly and all that, uh, they're not going to be at the marriage of the Lamb. And you'll see that tonight when we get to Matthew chapter 22. The guy that didn't have him on the wedding garment, he's sent to outer darkness because he didn't clothe himself with it. We'll be talking about that tonight as we proceed ahead on this. I trust you see the importance of this message. You'll be a hearer and a doer of it, and you'll see the Lord accomplish the great work in you. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of this word, and we rejoice at the great work that is being accomplished as we're clothing ourselves 
with the garments of God, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Well, tonight we'll continue talking on this subject.